talking about the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is that moment where God takes all of those who have faithfully served him and are serving him that are saved, where he takes them out of this world and then judgment begins to be released upon this earth. The next major biblical event to take place is the rapture of the church. Nothing else needs to happen. It could happen today. It could happen while you're sitting here. It can happen in the twinkling of a moment of an eye. And when it does happen, it will be just like that. For those who are unprepared, it'll be like a thief in the night. Scripture says that there'll be two working. One will be taken and one will be left. Two will be laying in the bed. One will be taken and one will be left. For those that are living their life with the expectation that he is returning for them. They are like a bride preparing herself to meet her bridegroom to go to be with him. That's the church that lives with expectation. They live with an attitude of preparing themselves to meet Jesus. That's the way we should be living. That's the way I want to help us to get there. We don't wait till next week or 10 months from now. We start preparing right now so that we can meet Jesus as a bride that has prepared herself for that moment. He's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, or without blemish. I want that to be you. I want that to be us. So the rapture is going to take place. When the rapture takes place, then there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. Every single person that is raptured, caught up, taken out of this world, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. At this judgment seat, everything you've ever done since you've given your life to Jesus will be tried by fire. The things that were done out of a godly motive, that were done from a right heart, the words you spoke that were right, those things will be like precious metal going through the fire. They don't get consumed. They get a reward for them. But the things that you did that were wrong motive, things you shouldn't have done, things that you shouldn't have said, because Scripture said we will give an account for every idle word we've ever spoken. Those things will be like hay, wood, and stubble. They'll be consumed by the fire. We're going to experience that but we're still going to be into heaven, get into heaven. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Then I talked to you last week uh, out of Revelation chapter 6. It's the four horsemen or the apocalypse of the four horsemen. It is, it is a, it's a synopsis of the seven years of tribulation. If you want to know what the seven years of tribulation are going to be like, Read Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 19. And you'll take a deeper dive into what it will be like here on earth during that seven years. Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 6 are in essence an overview. It's a 30,000 foot view of what Revelation 6 to Revelation 19 takes a deeper dive on. So when, when the church is raptured, the four horsemen, the rider, the white horse, the rider, the red horse, the rider, the black horse, and the rider, the pale horse, which are four distinct seasons throughout the seven years will begin to be released upon this earth. Now there are the different judgments, the seal judgments, the bowl judgments, the trumpet judgments, can read about that in the verses or the chapters I just mentioned. At the end of the seven years of tribulation, well, let me back up and say this. There is in Revelation chapter 20, there is a 144,000 Jewish people that get born again. They are supernaturally anointed by Almighty God to be evangelists and they evangelize the entire world. They are, there's also what is called the two witnesses that are supernaturally anointed by God that will do signs, wonders, and miracles, and the Antichrist will not be able to kill them. They will be used by God, and the greatest awakening this earth has ever experienced will happen during the seven years of tribulation. 
Many people that refuse the mark of the beast, that refuse to worship uh, the Antichrist as God, those people will be beheaded for their faith, many of them. Very few people will be able to make it through the seven short years of tribulation to the other side and serve Jesus. Thank God that we don't have to go through the seven years of tribulation. If you go through the seven years of tribulation, it is your decision to go through the seven years of tribulation because Jesus has done everything that needs to be due to, 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 to stop you from having to go through the seven years. He's made a way for you not to have to do that. So, uh, so anyway, I, I need to pace myself. I'm on fire right now. It's like I've come out here, volume 10, wide open. Just going to crank it up and break the knob off and go. I'm going to preach like this is my last time to ever get to preach to you. Because for some, that could be true. So at the end of the seven years of tribulation, the tribulation period, especially the, three, the last three and a half years, This world will experience hell like it has never, ever experienced ever. It'll be horrible. In the middle of the seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple and tell people he is God. And he will demand that people worship him. The false prophet, which will be a religious leader that will lead the one world religion, will leverage his influence so that everyone will show their allegiance to the Antichrist. He will tell people that the Antichrist is God and we need to worship him. So there's going to be the Antichrist, there's going to be the false prophet, there will be a cashless society, there will be a one world currency, there will be all those things put into place for the purpose of being able to control people on the planet to do what they want you to do. At the end of the seven years of tribulation, this is the second return of Jesus Christ. First time Jesus came, he came like a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. First time he rode into Jerusalem, he was on a donkey. Second time he comes back, it's Revelation chapter 19. The return of Jesus is one of the five fundamental doctrines of the New Testament Christian church, of the evangelical church. If these five fundamentals are not part of your life, then you are not really part of the true church of Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't coming back for a denomination. He's coming back for a group of people that are sons and daughters that have been born again, that believe what the Bible teaches. Five fundamental doctrines. Number one, it's the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the virgin birth. It's the blood atonement and the resurrection. It's the inerrancy of Scripture. And we're living in a time right now where people are saying that God inspired people and inspired people wrote the Bible about God. They're trying to take away the integrity of the Scripture. I want you to understand the word of God has been purified seven times and that's what the scripture says. And yes, I will prove scripture. I will use scripture to prove the accuracy of scripture. It is the word of God. It is perfect. It is good for doctrine. It is good for rebuking. It is good for edification. It is good for exhortation. The number, the fifth thing is the second coming of Jesus. It is the second most talked about subject in the Bible, which is the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is returning. He is returning at the end of the seven years of tribulation, and he's coming back to this earth, and he's coming back to rule and reign. Revelation 19 verse 11 says this, it says, now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful, true, 
And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Now, I'm going to break every verse down that we go through. We're going to go verse by verse. Break this down. Jesus is on a white horse. White horses back in that day, whether it's Old Testament or in the days that Jesus was walking around on the ground, or when John, who was on the island of Patmos, who had this revelation, lived, when a king conquered a territory, he would come riding in on a white horse. White horse was a symbolic statement of we have conquered, we are victorious. Jesus is coming back on this white horse. When John had this moment, he was worshiping the Lord on the island of Patmos. He had been thrown into a pot of oil. He had been boiled. He had been tormented. It was a place of imprisonment. He wasn't in some luxury retreat place laying on a beach somewhere. He had been thrown there because he served Jesus. He had this moment he was worshiping God. And I would encourage you to really become a real worshiper. Don't be a spectator. Learn how to worship God. Learn how to open up your heart. Learn how to lift your hands. Learn how to let love come flowing out of you. Cultivate a passion for the presence of God. To pursue him. John was worshiping the Lord. As he was worshiping the Lord, he was caught up into the spirit. Without really worshiping God, you will never get caught up in the spirit to see what God wants you to see. He saw an open door. And then he heard a voice that was Almighty God giving him an invitation. God gives us that same invitation. He said, come up here. Some of you need to come up a little higher. Quit trying to pull God down and let God lift you higher. John got caught up into the spirit. He saw the open door and he went through it. When he went through it, everything we're reading, he began to see. He saw it, but he saw it as if it had already happened. That's why he said Jesus came in on a white horse. He was seeing it as if Jesus had already conquered. But he wrote it thousands of years ago. See, people read the newspaper to see what happened. People watch the news to see what's happening. But we read the Bible to see what's going to happen. John was in the spirit. He went into the future and he saw this moment. Many of us, all, hopefully all of us, will experience this in the very near future. So Jesus is on this white horse. And he said, he who, was, he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Faithful. Jesus has always been faithful to what, is, what the heavenly father wanted him to do. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. I only do what he tells me to do. He was faithful to the father and he was faithful to the mission. That's what we need to be. We need to be faithful to God and faithful to the mission. Say that with me. Say faithful to God and faithful to the mission. And he called him true. Why did he call him true? He's on a white horse. Why did he call him true? True in the original word, the original language right here means the real Messiah. Because the counterfeit fake had come in Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, the first rider of the white horse is the Antichrist. He is coming as God, but he's not really God. He is the Antichrist. He is trying to take Christ's place. It's the abomination of desolation. It's where he wants the world to worship him as God. So he comes in as a counterfeit, but he's not the real thing. And then here comes Jesus. He is the real thing, the real Messiah, the real Savior of the world. And he will, in righteousness, judge and make war. So he will not make war out of vengeance. He will make war with all of his enemies out of righteousness. He will make war with them. 
Verse 12 says, and his eyes are like flames of fire. Now, that's figurative language. Have you ever been around somebody that can look at you and you felt like they look right into the depth of your soul and knew everything about you? <laughs> well, that's what this means right here. That his eyes will see everything about you and know everything about you. Know the motive of your heart. Know everything you did. Know everything you thought. Knows everything about you. And when he looks with those fiery eyes, fiery eyes, you will know that he knows that he knows everything that you've ever done for those that are still here. I don't want to say you because I don't want this to be you. And so he looks at people's hearts, their thoughts. It says that on his head, there are many crowns. Have you ever wondered why many crowns? When the Antichrist came, he had a crown, singular, and it was a laurel crown, which is a fading crown, like an athlete would compete in a competition, and when he won, especially back in Caesar's day or in the Roman times, when they would compete in the Olympics, they would get laurel crowns for their victory, but they would fade. The Antichrist, his victory is temporary. Jesus is coming with a permanent crown. It's a royal diadem. It is an everlasting crown. But it says he has many crowns. Why does he have many? Because the Bible says he's king of kings and lord of lords. He is going to have a crown for every nation. Because in this moment, the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of our God. Our king will rule over Germany. Our king will rule over the continent of Africa. Our kingdom... Our king will rule over Australia, New Zealand, and every other, in China, and every other country. So he have all these crowns on his head. He had, he had a name written on it that no one knew. Now, why would he have a name that nobody knows if we already know his name is Jesus? All throughout the Bible, God has revealed a portion of his nature or his character throughout time that people had never seen. And when he would reveal that portion of his nature or character, he would always put a name with it. In the Bible, a name symbolically represents the nature of the character. Like when God revealed himself is Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord God that heals. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's Jehovah Shalom. He was Jehovah Makedesh. There are all these names that, there are eight compound names throughout the Old Testament that reveal the character of God. He's Jehovah Jireh, the all-sufficient provider. He's El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. He revealed these names to reveal his nature. There is a part of Jesus our minds have not yet been able to comprehend. When he comes back, he is going to have a name that only he knows that we will learn when he comes back. We're going to learn things about him we didn't even know about him. You may think you know that there are know everything that there is to know about him, but there's so much to him. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And we will be elevated into a place where he teaches us things. Our minds are not yet able to comprehend. Verse 13 says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, many people say that his robe has been dipped in the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. That is not the blood that his robe has been dipped in. This blood is the blood that was splattered onto his robe as his enemies are annihilated. That's where this blood comes from. And his name is called the Word of God. Now, the Word of God right here is making reference not to this. This is called the Logos, 
from Genesis to Revelation, it's the logos, meaning the written word of God. Right here, the word, he is the word of God. It is a, it's the same thing in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word, be, and the word so in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word is God. In verse 14, it said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, the word of God right here means the gospel. It means God's plan of redemption. So in the beginning was God's plan of redemption. God's plan of redemption dwelt with God. God's plan of redemption was manifested among people. Revelation 19, the word of God, God's plan of redemption shows up. God has always had his plan of redemption, even before he created man in the very beginning garden of the garden, Adam and Eve. He knew they were going to sin. And some of you may be wondering, why would God create people if he knew they were going to sin? So let me ask you, mom and dad, why would you have children? When you know your children are going to mess up and do things they shouldn't do. Why? Because you want to love. That's why. God has this innate desire to love. That's why he's created people. But he created a plan to redeem all of those that he loves. And even those that don't respond to his plan, he loves. So when he shows up as the word of God, it means this is God's plan of redemption. Verse 19 says, And the armies of heaven clothed in white, fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. The armies in heaven. This is the end of the seven years of tribulation. There are two groups of people that are in this army right here. Number one, it's angels. There are angels that are part of this army. Number two, it's all of the saints that have been raptured at the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. We are coming back with Jesus. Now, in the early days of being saved, I remember hearing a guy preach one time about this moment. And he said, we're going to come back and we're part of the army. We're going to have the full armor of God on. Jesus is going to have a sword. We're going to have a sword. And we're going to fight the enemy. And we're going to go into the battle of Armageddon. And we're going to slay the enemy. And we're going to fight. And we're going to fight. And we're going to fight. And we're going to kill all the enemy. But that's not really what happens? That was good preaching. It was just, I, I was like, give me my sword. I'm ready. <laughs> because if it were that way, you know we couldn't come back with Jesus and be defeated in that battle. Because we've already read the rest of the story. But that's not what happens. Notice it said that we are clothed, we are clothed with white linen that's clean. Jesus' robe has blood on it. Our linen has no blood on it. Jesus isn't even going to lift a sword to destroy the enemies that align against him. When the, when the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of the armies of the world gather in the valley to fight against Jesus, he won't even have to lift a sword. We don't even come back with weapons. We come back on white horses. White horses symbolically represent conquering. That's why the Bible said we are more than conquerors. To be more than a conqueror means you don't have to conquer anything. We get to ride in in victory that he obtained for all of us. This will be one of the most unclimactic events in the entire Bible. You would think that such a pinnacle moment that there would be chapters and chapters written about this moment. But there isn't. It's just a little portion in Revelation 19. Why? Because it's over just like that. Jesus just speaks the word and it happens. You know, in Ephesians, it talks about the word of God being like a sharp two-edged sword, piercing even to the soul piercing even to the marrow of the bone. That's why sometimes we're in church and people are convicted, right? You're under, you, you, something just pierces your heart. It brings conviction. And you're like, I got to make some adjustments in my life. I got to repent of some things in my life. I got to get right with God. It's because the word of God pierces our heart. 
or you're living life somewhere and you read the Bible or something happens and the Holy Spirit convicts you, goes to the core of your being, convicts our soul. It goes into the depth of our being, convicts us to get us right with God, to cut away sinful things, fleshly things. But in this moment, Revelation 19 verse 15 says, out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. That with it he should strike the nations. This moment when he speaks, it'll be like a sword. But it won't convict their soul. It will physically split them in two. With the breath of his mouth, all of the enemies will be scattered just like that and split apart. And their blood, the Bible says, will rise to the level of a horse's bit, its nostrils. That'll be the depth of the blood. It'll be the blood of his enemies. Revelation 19, 16 says, And on his robe and on his thigh a name is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Why doesn't it just say he's king and he's Lord? The word king means ruler. The word Lord means master. He is the king of kings And he is the Lord of lords. On his robe it says it. On his thigh it says it. When someone comes riding in on a horse, one of the first parts that you see, it is what's on their chest and it's what's on their thigh. When Back in that day, when a soldier would get on a horse, they would pull up their clothing so that they would have freedom. And so when, when Jesus comes back, you will see his leg, and on it, it's going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. When he comes into that valley and he speaks a word, they will see him coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. Part of our reward for those of us that got raptured at the beginning of the seven years of tribulation will be our assignment in what we get to do through the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. When Jesus comes back at this moment, it is the beginning of a thousand year millennial reign. It is when the earth will be restored to the condition that it was in before sin entered into the garden. It'll be when the lion lays down with the lamb. Your kids will be able to go outside. You won't have to be worried about a snake biting them, a dog attacking them, an evil man coming and snatching them up and kidnapping them. There will be worldwide peace in every part of the globe. There will be worldwide peace. He will be king of kings. Those of us that have served faithfully with Jesus during this life, we will rule and reign with him through the thousand-year millennial reign. For some of us, he's going to say, I'm going to make you the mayor of Costa Mesa. I'm going to make you the mayor of Santa Ana. I'm going to make you the mayor of Newport Beach. I'm going to make you the sheriff of Orange County, even though we're not going to need law enforcement. He's going to say, I'm going to make you the governor of California. I could do a much better job than a present governor. Restraining myself. Because the spirit of the Antichrist is working even now. The, the, so we're going to rule and reign with him according to our faithfulness now. And part of our rewards will be what he tells us we get to do during the thousand year millennial reign. Now some people, because they don't really serve God, they just got saved but don't serve God, they're going to be street sweepers in the thousand year millennial reign. Hey, it's going to be peaceful now. It's going to be nice, but at least, you know. You got a job in the kingdom. All rewards are not equal. Don't think they are. Don't think that all rewards are equal in heaven. They are not. The Bible does not teach that. That is your made-up theology that you created in your head without ever reading your Bible. God rewards us based off of our faithfulness right now. That's why Jesus said, Don't store up your treasures on earth where moth can get to it and rust can corrupt it and all those things. He said, store up your treasures in heaven. Eternity is a long time. We're going to rule and reign with him. Part of what I'm saying is tongue in cheek and I'm joking a little bit, but there's elements of truth in what I just said. 
The reason, so, so when I started preaching this over the last, this past month, some people were like, I can't believe nobody's ever told us this before. Can't, I, I didn't know this was in the Bible like this. Why is this like this? And it's, it's given to us to warn us and to prepare us. Jesus has done everything that needs to be done so that we don't experience this. You don't have to go through seven years of tribulation. I'm preaching this to not, not to try to scare you, to prepare you. I want to see you in that group of people that are taken out when the rapture happens. Jesus left heaven and came to this earth because it was impossible for us to get to where he is. He got into our world and made a way for us to get into his world. You've never given your life to Jesus. You need to do that today. You've drifted away from God. You need to come back to Jesus. He's not mad at you. You need to come back to him. The worst place to be when the rapture takes place is in a backslidden place. I don't have time to talk about the story, the parable that Jesus taught of ten virgins. That's a picture of the church. If you were to just take that one parable, that means 50% of the church is going to be left here during the seven years of tribulation. Because that church had no oil. They were backslidden. They're away from God. This is no time to be away from God. If you've got habitual sin in your life, you need to repent. You need to come clean. God knows it's there. You might as well confess it to Him and invite God into helping you to get free from it. God doesn't come at you with a clenched fist. He's coming at you with a loving heart. And it looks like a Savior who died on a cross. He's saying, I will restore you. I'll cleanse you. I'll wash you. I'll give you eternal life. I will re reinstate you into the place that you used to be. That's what he did to the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15. He gave him everything back that he lost. Gave him his authority back. Gave him the robe back. Gave him the sandals back. Gave him a party back. Put him back where he belonged. But he had to repent and get back where he needed to be. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. You're not where you need to be with Jesus. You've never given your life to the Lord. You've drifted away from God. The Lord has convicted you. He's spoken to you. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. We're going to pray together. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't put it off. On the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three. Raise it up. Raise it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Thank you. 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 Hands all over this church are raised. Every one of you that raised your hand. I want you to stand up right where you are right now. Stand up. You got it. You can do it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, right here, second row, the polo hoodie. The Lord's got a special plan for your life. When I was worshiping the Lord, the Lord caused me to look at you. And I could just sense, I kept saying, okay, God, what do you want to say to her? What do you want to do in her? And all I could sense, I couldn't get clarity around what the Lord, but I just saw you're on God's radar. God's got you on his radar. And he's got you on his radar because he loves you and he has a great plan for your life. He's got a great plan for every single one of you. Every one of you that are standing, stay standing. I want to ask everybody in this room to stand with those who have stood. Now, those of you that stood first, I want you to get your phone. If you have any belongings, you can bring them. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come right here. I'm going to pray with you right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. Some of you have no idea about how your life is about to change. You're going to be blown away at what God does in your life. I could have never imagined the night that Jesus came into my life that my life would change so much that I would be doing this one day. And God is going to change your lives the same way he changed my life. We're going to help you. We're all going to pray together. Eternal life is a free gift. 
If I wanted to give you a gift, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to do anything except receive it. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is God's free gift of redemption. It's his love. When we receive his free gift, all of our sins are washed away. For you to receive a gift, you have to let go of what's in your hand and reach out and grab what's in his hand that he's given to you. That's the way we repent. We're like, I'm going to let go of my sin and I'm going to grab a hold of Jesus because he's a free gift. We're going to pray together. Every one of us, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Everybody pray out loud with me and those who have come. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I believe you died on a cross and you did it just for me. And you've been raised from the dead and you're alive today. Forgive me. Come into my life. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I give you everything. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.